morning, everyone. Let's all find a seat, please. Good morning, good morning. Before we get into our teaching today, I have a few announcements that uh, need to be made. Um, tomorrow is July 4th, and we're hoping that <clears throat> the rain is going to hold off long enough for us to be participating once again in the July 4th parade, the Dale City July 4th parade. Yesterday, a church-wide email went out. If you did not receive that email, uh, let me know. I actually have a copy right up here on, my, on the podium here. But I wanted to make everybody aware of what we're attempting to, uh, to do tomorrow. Um, We've got a lot of prep work that still needs to be done. Much of what's left to do actually has to be done at the parade, what they call the staging area. The staging area is where all of the floats go and stage. <laughs> they put the stuff on their floats and everything. So I'm not gonna go through, give you all uh, addresses and everything because that's in the email that went out. But, uh, a couple of fine points from the email I wanted to point out was, number one, those of you who are planning on coming and helping tomorrow morning with loading up the stuff that will need to be loaded up, which will include probably not a lot of sound equipment. We're gonna try to do, load some of that up tonight, but uh, there'll be a bunch of, well, everything that's gonna go on the float is gonna be loaded tomorrow morning. So, we're gonna try to get here bright and chipper, six o'clock a.m., because we really wanna roll out of this yard as close to 6.30 as possible, because we really wanna get to the parade staging area as close to 7 a.m. as possible, because this year we have to be in our parade position by 8.30. Now, the parade doesn't start, until 10 a.m. Um, but we need to be, I think they're trying to avoid what happened last year or the year before where it was just a fiasco of trying to get all the floats because they, you know, they blocked the road off and they've got <clears throat> all these different size vehicles trying to, <clears throat> last year, I think it was two years ago, they, they have the, the, uh, the number of whatever number slot you're in, they have it in a little peg in the ground. And last year they had pegs like that far apart. You can't get too many vehicles uh, in a space of about 25 feet long. And so it was just, a, so all, everybody was trying to figure out, well, where are we supposed to go? <clears throat> so I think by having us get, getting set up at 8.30, it gives them 90 minutes, 90 minutes for everybody to sort of work, work around whatever problems will inevitably, whenever you have, 45, 50,000 people converging on an area within a couple of hours, you can be sure problems are gonna, are gonna happen. So, so anyway, those of you who want to come early in the morning to help us get things onto the float, uh, six o'clock is the time we need to be here, especially if you're mission critical. Those of you who know exactly what you're doing and don't lead, need a lot of direction, we need to roll out of here at 6.30 a.m sharp, so <clears throat> we're gonna be pushing for that, uh, that time limitation. Trying to get to this uh, parade staging area at seven o'clock a.m. In the email is the details concerning where the staging area is. For those of you that are just gonna go ahead, not show up here and drive there, uh, please make sure that you are as, at the staging area as close to 7 a.m. as possible if you're going to be helping to set up the float and decorate the float. A lot of decorating to do, <clears throat> a lot of taping and stapling and nailing and all kinds of stuff. So try to get there as close to 7 a.m. as possible. Uh, in one of the emails, I think the original email, 
It said that if push comes to shove and you're late, just be there by 10 o'clock to help hand out tracks. Uh, the truth is you may have a very difficult time getting anywhere near us at 10 o'clock because of the way that they block off the streets. I don't know where you would park. I don't know if the parking is as available, especially since this year, we're a little further down toward the front. Last year, I think they have like 150 floats, something like that. <clears throat> Last year, we were in the 100s, if, as far as where our little uh, plot was, our slot was, but this year, we're 52. And so we're way down toward the front, well, maybe halfway through. So if you park in the, uh, one of the addresses that's there, uh, you may end up being farther. Actually, I think, I think we're okay. If you were to park where we parked in the shopping center last year, you would be you know, a mile away from where we actually are. <clears throat> so getting there at 10 might be too late. <laughs> so try to get there more like, if you're, if you're gonna be late, make 8.30 late, because that's, <laughs> that's what time we'll be heading over to the, where our float position's gonna be. So other than that, uh, those of you that are going to be volunteering for the family fun, family fun Day booth, I think the email said Family Fun Booth Day. <laughs> I'm looking at it right here. I thought, mm, that's a typo. <laughs> no, it's not the Family Fun Booth Day. It's the Family Day, Family Fun Day booth. <laughs> it's another one of those try to say that 10 times real fast things. Uh, <clears throat> please talk to Pastor Byron about that. I'll let him handle all the details about that. Just see him and he'll get you squared away because I'm not even sure exactly what time they're meeting here, what time they're going there. So I don't have any details on that. All right, now, the big question is, well, what's gonna happen because they're calling for rain? Well, they've, they've updated the forecast a little bit, but uh, they're still calling for rain tomorrow. We're not gonna make a decision about stopping or allowing the weather to cancel everything out, we're not gonna make that decision till tomorrow morning. <laughs> so um, it's gonna be, uh, let's pray like crazy that the Lord holds the rain off. We only need a few hours. So uh, Lord, just hold those skies, skies back till, I don't know, maybe one o'clock or something. And then as soon as we get everything inside, we can let her rip, let the rain rip. So uh, we'll see what happens, folks. Alrighty, I think that's a good enough summary. Jason mentioned to you guys uh, <clears throat> about as soon as the service is over here, we'll go ahead and try to hightail it out of here and head downstairs and grab some food because um, the band's gonna be setting up in here and they're gonna be uh, jamming with some nice loud music. So we will wanna clear this area out so that we don't lose our hearing. <clears throat> No, I'm just kidding. Actually, they'll need it kind of quiet, so we're trying to, we're testing some new equipment. By the way, these are not hood ornaments that are up here. <clears throat> we were gonna set some flower pots on them to make it look a little better. These are new subwoofers that we have for out, outdoor events, and uh, we didn't have any place to put them until tomorrow except the stage, so that's why they're up on the stage, but they look kind of nice, don't they? I'm gonna go over and stand on one when I teach, and <clears throat> that'll put me up nice and high so you guys can see me. And uh, yes, <clears throat> exactly. So that's for tomorrow, all righty? That's it. Let's go to Philippians chapter three. <clears throat> Philippians chapter three. <clears throat> and we're going to begin reading at verse eight. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to pray. Uh, excuse me, we're going to start at verse 7. <clears throat> Philippians 3, 7. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, 
the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we do want to thank you so much for your precious word that you're allowing us right now to assemble together in this room to read, to be taught, to hopefully meditate on. Lord, we want to thank you so much for the instruction that you give us in your word as we're constantly having to learn <clears throat> the lesson that we're to trust in you with all of our heart and not to lean on our own understanding. Lord, from your word, we get the understanding that we need to have. And it's an understanding that confounds the foolishness of this world, the wisdom of this world. And Lord, we're humbled that you have opened the eyes of babes and allowed us to see what we see. Today we pray, Father, that you would continue to open our eyes and our hearts and help us to see from the text today how we can develop spiritually and grow in our walks and to a greater understanding of you and grow in our commitment to you to be obedient children. So Lord, speak to us today, we ask. And Lord, touch our hearts today. We really do need a touch from you today, God. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, verse 11 is where we left off last week. Let's look at that again. Continuation of the sentence in verse 10. In order that I may attain <clears throat> to the resurrection from the dead. In order that, or if by any means, that could also be read as... I may attain or arrive at as a goal the resurrection of the dead. Here in verse 11, Paul appears to be transitioning from the spiritual application of Christ's resurrection in verse 10 to a literal bodily resurrection in verse 11. We talked last week about how being conformed to his death refers to the life of a believer that is yielded to the Lord, dying to self, so that Christ's resurrected life can live through them. <clears throat> and though Paul uh, presently experiences the new life and resurrection power that enables him to live as Christ's servant, he also looks expectantly to the resurrection life to come when he will be granted a resurrection body in the presence of his Savior. And this is what he's referring to in verse 11. <clears throat> he's longing to not only be identified spiritually with Christ's resurrection, but literally as well. The resurrection of the body represents perfection at every level of existence. And so it is mentioned here as the culmination of his spiritual, spiritual pilgrimage. Now, the opening words of verse 11 perhaps need a little bit of, a, of an explanation. The phrase, in order that, might give the impression that there is uncertainty about whether Paul expected to be resurrected. Rather than going through all of the opinions that there are from a variety of sources, as to what's behind Paul's opening words in verse 11, I'd just like to jump right into the most likely reason that Paul is, has worded it this way, and that is that Paul is simply expressing his humility. Regardless of where he was spiritually, 
Paul's sense of unworthiness never left him. Remember in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, Paul said, for I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. It's always important to distinguish between the firm, unmovable object of our hope and our own subjective apprehension of it. We'll talk a little bit more about this later on. But he continues in verse 12. Let's read on. He says, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Now, even though most English translations begin a new paragraph <clears throat> right here at 312, we must not lose sight of the close connection with what follows. Verses 12 through 14 are an extension of what Paul has stated in verses 7 through 11, though with a focus on his present efforts in pursuing Christ. Now, one question that may be asked as we go back to the beginning of verse 12 is what did Paul mean by the statement, not that I already obtained? Obtained what? Well, the text doesn't specify what it is. It's commonly understood to be referring to resurrection from the dead, the resurrection from the dead that he just mentioned in verse 11. We do have to point out that the word it is not actually in the text. It was added by the translators because it is inferred. I personally think that it narrows the meaning too much. It constrains it too tightly to suggest that the sentence is only referring back to verse 11 since Paul is speaking about the full experience of being a Christian in the previous section. There's nothing that limits this linguistically to just referring to verse 11. Rather, I think that Paul seems to be alluding to the fact that he has not yet grasped the fullness of knowing Christ, gaining Christ and being found in him, gaining the righteousness of God that depends on faith, the resurrection from the dead, or even the little trilogy there in verse 10 of knowing him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And what solidifies this understanding, at least in my mind, is that he adds the phrase, or have already become perfect. The word perfect there, or perfected, refers to, not to the resurrection in the previous verse, or not merely to that, but to the whole subject of conformity to Christ. In other words, Paul remains in process in this life. He knows Christ, but he longs to know him more. He's justified freely by faith in Christ, but that righteous status before God will most fully be declared true at the judgment day yet to come. Thus, Paul has not yet fully received or obtained any of what he's longing to gain. Indeed, he has not yet been perfected. And so these verses continue the sense of what life is like in the present while Paul and all believers gaze into the future and long for the culmination of Christ's kingdom. But then he says, not that I've already obtained or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul says, I press on to make it my own. 
The verb translated there, press on, is the same one that Paul used in verse 6 to recall that he persecuted the church in his pre-conversion days. And the result is actually a subtle word play. In effect, Paul is saying that he devotes the same sort of intense energy and effort that was once directed towards persecuting the church to pursuing progress in being made into the image of Christ. That same energy that he expended doing the wrong thing, he now by the grace of God and through the power of the Spirit is pursuing progress in being made into the image of Christ. But the only reason that Paul is able to press forward to make perfection his own is that Christ has first made Paul his own. Don't miss that part there in verse 12. The order is essential as it places emphasis on the initiative of divine grace and election as the foundation of Paul's pursuit of growth and holiness. In effect, we have another statement of what Paul articulated back in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, where he asserted that the primacy of God's work and our sanctification as that which enables and empowers our responsibility. Another way of looking at Paul's words here are to recognize the, inter the interplay between, and you've heard me say this before, I don't know if you remember it or not, but the interplay between the already and not yet. You ever heard those phrases before? The already and the, and the not yet? In other words, Christ has already made the believer his own. And as a result, the believer presses forward towards the perfection that is not yet his, but will one day come at the resurrection. So the picture here is of Christ pursuing and overtaking the sinner who's actually running away from him. You guys know that we love him because he first loved us, right? We were running from him. He pursued, he overtook the sinner, making him his own, and then began leading him in a new direction to pursue, to pursue the final goal of perfection. So Paul was running spiritually to catch the very thing for which Christ Jesus had come after him. In other words, Paul's goal in life was consistent with Christ's goal in saving him. Jesus said, I've ransomed you for a reason, so pursue that. He continues in verse 13 and 14. He says, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now I think verses 13 and 14 are amongst a range of verses in the New Testament that are catalysts for urging spiritual growth. In the opening clause of verse 13, Paul reiterates and clarifies what he has just asserted in verse 12. He says, I do not regard myself as having laid a hold of it. That phrase there, do not regard, means consideration that is made as a result of careful thought and deliberation. He said, I don't regard myself as having grasped it yet. Now this is not a denial of the finished work of Christ on the cross. Paul is not contradicting what he affirmed elsewhere about the security that a believer has. He has already stated categorically that he wants no part of a righteousness that's based on works. He began his Christian journey by faith and faith will be the means by which he reaches his goal. 
What Paul is emphasizing here is the need for all Christians to respond faithfully to the grace of God bestowed upon them and the salvation that has been, that is anchored in faith alone. Paul isn't saying, I'm going to live as though my works get me in. He's not saying that. But what he is saying is that his life belongs to the one who apprehended him. And of course, that, that one who apprehended him was Jesus himself. Despite his nearly 30 years of following Christ at this point, Paul recognizes that he has much to learn and he has areas to grow in. In contrast to the staleness that sometimes characterizes those who have been believers for many years, Paul continued to recognize his, his need for greater Christ-likeness through repeated and fresh applications of the gospel to his life. And so, <clears throat> how does Paul respond to not yet reaching the point of perfection that must wait must await the final resurrection? Does this realization sink him into despondency? Or does it lead him to a life of sin, knowing that perfection is impossible in this life anyway, so what's the point? Does it cause him to blame, to place blame on his environment or others around him for his shortcomings? Well, it's that person's fault that I <clears throat> blow my top all the time. Does it spur him to pursue godliness through a detailed list of spiritual disciplines, hoping that if he just follows the right formula, he'll reach his goal? Well, it's actually none of the above. In contrast to 12 steps or seven laws or five principles or 40 days, Paul says in verse 13, but one thing I do... Now, the one thing does, in fact, consist of a set of factors. But the fact that he says, this one thing I do, shows that he is singularly, singularly focused. One thing I do, he says, is forgetting what lies behind. Now, while the verb there rendered forgetting can refer to having no memory of something. Here the verb actually has the softer sense of just simply not paying attention to. After all, Paul has just finished listing his past accomplishments. And these past accomplishments are among the things that lie behind. Forgetting what lies behind, he says. I think the expression is intentionally broad to cover not merely Paul's failures, but perhaps even more to include his, the successes that he mentioned in verses four through six. The point here is that Paul forgets the things that are now in his past, realizing that they lack the power to make him more like Christ. This does not mean that these things have had no effect on Paul, as they have clearly shaped who he is but it is absolutely clear that Paul in no way believed that his identity has been determined by his pre-conversion past. But the corollary to forgetting what lies behind is reaching forward or straining forward, he says, to what lies ahead. By referring to what lies ahead, Paul is again intentionally broad. Though in the context, the focus would seem to be on the state of perfection that will be realized at the resurrection. But here, using athletic imagery drawn from ancient Greco-Roman foot races, Paul himself, Paul portrays himself as a runner who strains forward towards the goal of the finish line. And just as a runner's speed is slackened, should he think of those who are behind him and the 
the pounding of their feet. So the Christian's onward progress is hindered should he dwell on the past that he has that, are, that could be full of failures or sins or discouragements or disappointments or even thwarted hopes and plans. Paul envisions himself as running the Christian race with his eyes fixed on Jesus, straining toward the finish line. God did not design the Christian life to be lived looking backwards at our past, but rather forwards towards our future hope. Christians too often <clears throat> serve as, a, as voluntary slaves to their past, even though Christ has freed them from both the shames and the pseudo-glories of what they had before they knew Christ. John MacArthur has an interesting quote about what Paul is saying in verse 13. He said that Paul made a break with everything in his past, both good and bad, religious achievements, virtuous deeds, great successes in ministry, as well as sins, as well as sins, missed opportunities, and disasters must all be forgotten. They do not control the present or the future. Believers cannot live on past victories, nor should they be debilitated by the guilt of past sins. Churches are full of spiritual cripples, paralyzed by the grudges, bitterness, sins, and tragedies of the past. I mean, let's face it, some of us just never get over what we ex we've experienced in the past and consequently make very little progress in the now or the future. Others try to survive in the present by reliving past successes. MacArthur goes on. They must break with that past if they are to pursue the spiritual prize. God is interested in what believers do now and in the future. No one, declared Jesus, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. The clearest vision belongs to those who forget the past. Those are good words. Those are really good words. Does anybody have regrets today that weigh them down? No one besides me? <laughs> Never think about that, huh? Good for you. You're obeying this. But verse 14 again, he says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So continuing the metaphor here, Paul likens his Christian life to pressing onward to the goal so as to win the prize. In applying the figure, the goal and the prize, I suppose are virtually identical though viewed perhaps from different aspects. I suppose we could say that the goal is at the finish line, the finish line at the end of the racetrack. The prize is the award presented to the winner. So here the goal would be to, to finish the race of life and perhaps <clears throat> more particularly the judgment seat of Christ. The prize would be the crown of righteousness which Paul elsewhere describes as the prize for those who have run well the upward call of God in Christ Jesus includes all of the purposes that God had in mind in saving us to begin with. This would include, obviously, salvation, conformity to Christ, joint heirship with Him, our home in heaven, and numberless other spiritual blessings. Paul ends this little section, verses 15 and 16. He says, let us therefore, look at this, as many as are perfect have this attitude, and if anything, or excuse me, and if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained Let's talk about these verses real quick. 
Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. Now, the word perfect that Paul is using here, by using this word, Paul is referring to maturity. He's talking about the developed. Let those who are perfect or developed, developed enough in their walks, let those who are developed enough in their walks have the same attitude that Paul has just described about himself. This should not be considered an extreme or radical view. Those who are mature in their thinking should know that what he's saying, what he has just said in the previous verses is logical. It's the logical, reasonable response to the Lord who has shed his blood for us who has empowered us to live this way. In other words, they should share Paul's willingness to suffer and die for Christ and to bend every effort in the quest for likeness to the Lord Jesus. This is the mature view of the Christian faith. But then he says in verse 15, if, if, it, if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. Paul understands that not all of the Philippians share the same level of spiritual maturity in the faith. The phrase uh, there, uh, if in anything you have a different attitude, that phrase there, is actually very important. You see, there may be indifference or there may be just plain old ignorance. If the Philippian believers are lax in their pursuit of spiritual goals or erroneously suppose that they've already arrived, then they need to understand Paul's declaration. And if they generally agree but still differ on some isolated point, Paul is confident, he says, that God will lead them to the truth if their minds are open to his leading. He is confident that through the word of God applied by the Holy Spirit in the context of the body of Christ, God will reveal areas where we as believers fall short of this single-minded pursuit of Christ. Thus, the revelation spoken of here is not merely of the fact that the believer may not have this mindset at all, but also of specific areas where the practical implications of this mindset have not yet worked themselves out in everyday life. It's easy for us as believers to profess to have the mindset that Paul is advocating in verses 1 through 14, but then fail to apply the implications of it to specific situations in our lives. And so this is where the Holy Spirit uses God's word and even the fellowship within the body of Christ that the gospel produces to reveal these areas and bring correction where necessary. So Paul's confident, hey, if this is something that, that, that you're not on board with yet, I trust that God's gonna help you to get on board to see that this really is just normal Christian living. But we'll close with verse 16. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we've attained. What this is essentially saying is, regardless of where you are in spiritual maturity, whatever rung of the ladder you happen to be on, make sure that you are progressing and not digressing. A brother in Christ once said, once said to me many years ago, he said, if you can ever remember a time in your walk when you were more on fire for Jesus than you are right now, then you're backslidden. That's kind of heavy, isn't it? But doesn't that make sense? What, what other condition would you call that? 
then you're backslidden. See, the, the idea here is progress. <clears throat> Not necessarily perfection. There, there's a difference there. Paul is seeking perfection. He recognizes he doesn't have it. He recognizes he's not all there. He doesn't do all of this perfectly, <clears throat> but there is a, there is this strong compulsion. No, I'm going to achieve this. No, I'm going to lay a hold of this. Christians who don't have that desire at all should be asking themselves, very seriously, where am I at? What has happened to me? Why am I not pursuing this? Why isn't this a desire in my heart? Why is there nothing on the inside that's compelling me to grow? Since the church is a living organism, it stands to reason that it should want to grow. <clears throat> a plant wants to grow. There are some things that can keep a plant from growing, but when a seed is put into the soil and it takes root and starts to grow, it, the plant wants to grow. Now some things, you, you can't hold it back. It's gonna grow like crazy. You know, you, you plant that cute little pine tree in your front yard, five inch, uh, two feet from your house, not realizing that in 15 years that you're gonna realize that was a pretty dumb thing to do. <laughs> as the roots dig into the foundation of your home and the branches pierce through the side of your house, you realize there's no stopping this thing from growing. Now, you, you, you could have stunted its growth. You could have planted it in bad soil, perhaps. But lo and behold, that tree is going to grow. It wants to grow. It desires to grow. And as Christians, we should desire to grow. That's what Paul's referring to here. We're, we're seeing his attitude toward growth. And he's saying, if, if there's indifference to this, my hope is that God will help you to see that whether it's indifference or ignorance, you'll see the, the importance of this. If it's indifference, you can see, no, there's no indifference to this. This is what growth looks like. This is what Christian life looks like. Now, to wind this down, let's just turn to two other places in the New Testament. <coughs> turn, first of all, to Hebrews chapter 12. And if you're... <clears throat> you have enough flexibility in your fingers, <laughs> stick a finger in 1 Corinthians 9. We're going to read from Hebrews 12 first. And then we're going to read from 1 Corinthians 9. Two places in the New Testament that have the same flavor of what we're reading here in Philippians 3. You know the Hebrews 12 one, I'm sure. Verses 1 and 2, we know these verses very well. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, there's, there's one of our goals right there. I mean, we, the cloud of witnesses is there. We look out and we see them, of course, not literally, but we, in the mind's eye, we know they're there. Many that have gone on before us, that have been received and welcomed into the presence of the Lord. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, cheering us on, so to speak, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which does so easily entangle us and let us crawl no, it doesn't say crawl. How about walk? Well, there is a walk. But now he's saying run. There's, there's energy here. There's exuberance. Let us run with endurance. It's a long race. There's going to be a, a lot of obstacles that are going to try us. 
Let us run with endurance. This is not a short sprint, folks. The race that is set before us, fixing our eyes. There's another thing we, there's another goal. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God, at the throne of God. So there we see this language running, pursuing, reaching out, reaching forward. And then 1 Corinthians 9. Here's another one of these <clears throat> passages that were Paul likens himself to a runner. To a runner and also to a fighter. One who fights. An athlete. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race run, all run? Everybody's in the race and everybody's competing at some level, right? We're all in the race, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. Well, wait a minute now. I mean, is everybody going to get the prize? I thought only one gets the prize. Well, he's speaking metaphorically here as those who are contending in, in, for example, the Olympics. Who goes into the Olympics thinking, I'm going for the bronze, man. Just give me that bronze. No, they want the gold. So pursue this as if there's only one prize to be had. Run in such a way that you may win. Fact is, everybody that runs this way wins as Christians. Everyone, he says in verse 25, who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Now, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. I mean, honestly, okay, they go to the Olympics. They get the little gold, silver, bronze medal around their neck. So what? Big deal. Okay, they might get their picture on a cereal box too. I suppose that's good. I mean, having your face on the Wheaties box it might be something that, a goal that you're striving for. But as he says there, that, that's just imperative. That's, what does that do? Ultimately, what does that mean? He continues, verse 26, Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim, now here is almost like he's switching metaphors real quick. I box in such a way as not beating the air. You know, boxers expend a lot more energy when they swing and miss. They don't want to miss. When a punch connects, it's less taxing on the body and it also builds momentum. They see they connected. They're happy. Dre adrenaline starts to flow that overcompensates whatever, however exhausted they may be. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Now that seems to be a bummer. I've used this analogy before but how many of you remember the 1972 Olympics? Is there anybody here that's old enough to remember the 1972 Olympics? Remember the, guy that got, the guys that got disqualified? You remember why? Because they were goofing off during the national anthems. They had won their medals. They were standing at the podium, as everybody does, and they were back there kind of yucking it up instead of standing like they're supposed to stand or however they're supposed to stand for the, for the national anthems of the various countries. They were kind of yucking it up, goofing off, smacking each other. They were disqualified. Oh, after that many years of beating their bodies, they were disqualified. Because as my Calvary Chapel, my fellow pastors like to say to me, Dave, finish well. There's, there's a race from the beginning to the end. And when we see the goal in sight, we don't slack up. That, that's not what the goal is supposed to do. 
The Tour de France is going on right now. It's the only sporting event I follow. I follow no other sporting event. And what do those guys do when they see the goal, especially the sprinters? Kick back, there it is, yeehaw. Guys, let's chill out. No, they're racing for it. They wanna hurry up and get there. They wanna win. So what Paul has been telling us in Philippians, yes, God has done a great work. Uh, yes, indeed, it's God who works in you, both the will and the do of his good pleasure. But he's working in you, both the will and do, do of his good pleasure. And it's all based on faith. It's all based on, on the firm foundation of what Jesus Christ accomplished for us on the cross. But brothers and sisters, let's ask ourselves today, are we in this race running it to win? Are we, or are we indifferent to that? Or are we just like, oh wow, I never really understood that. I was just kind of coasting along. There's no coasting along. There's pursuit. There's energy. There's agony. There's pain. There's tears. There's cross to carry. There's sin to overcome. It's not like, eh, we all sin once in a while, you know? Got to be a little carnality here and there. That should never be our attitude. Our, ad our attitude should be, I hate that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be this way. I don't want to fly off the handle this way. I don't want to look at that stuff on the internet. I don't want my heart to be filled with lust over that stuff. I don't want to flirt and play with my sin. Computers that want to win the prize, no, they can't dabble in that stuff. There's the weight and the sin that does so easily beset us as we saw in Hebrews 12. So there's two things. There's weights and, and sins. Some, some weights may not be sin per se, but there could be distractions. My weight could be I'm just lazy about pursuing God. I mean, there's a, there's a love there and God's always trying to stir me up, you know? But when I, when I should be getting up 30 minutes early, <clears throat> reading my Bible, I hit the snooze on that alarm clock just one more time. And then I get up at the last minute and off I go and launch out into my day without ever having spent time with God because I know I can't grow without that. So brothers and sisters, let us remember the words of Paul and let us not think for a minute, well, that Paul, you know, that guy was just such a nut. <laughs> what a zealot. No, that nut, that zealot, uh, was simply living out the normal Christian life. Let's stand. Any gospel preaching, any faith-based gospel preaching that doesn't encourage forward spiritual progress not settling on our laurels is not a gospel message. One of the great dangers that we ha have as Christians is settling into a, a spirit of lethargy. And we've couched all this in the right language because we've already, we've already talked about that Paul isn't, doesn't want to have a righteousness based on law. We're not talking about that. You all know that. We're just talking about having a heart for God. A heart for God. A heart that wants more of Jesus. We talk about that, right? Oh, Lord, more of you. More of you, yes, more of the Lord. We're going to be growing in our walks. We're going to be developing spiritually till the day we die. Hopefully. Hopefully that'll be our pursuit. And Lord, we so desperately need you to work that in our hearts, God. <clears throat> some of us, Lord, understand that and some of us are in full pursuit of that in our lives. And others are not. Lord, I know <clears throat> that, that there may be some in this room 
who were sort of living in that seed sown in the thorns way of life, where the cares of this world constantly are choking out productive seed growth. Lord, we pray that you would please move that seed over onto the very good soil because we want to grow whether it's 10, 20, 30, 40 fold. We want to grow. So Lord, help us to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And Lord, help us to forget those things which are behind. Oh my Lord, those failures in my life, God, that weigh me down, that make me dwell on where would I be if it wasn't for, Lord, help me to just lay that aside. Help me to not be hindered in my running. And Father, we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you all. a thousand voices just to lift your holy name and we will raise thousands more to sing of your beauty in this place when